thank you so much for having us, and thank you for that really wonderful um, introduction. You all made us sound um, very impressive. Um, and thank you all for being here and for spending one of the first beautiful DC spring slash summer. I'm from Minnesota, so this is like August weather. Um, but thank you for coming indoors and spending it with us. We will introduce ourselves more in a second here. Um, but first, I want to start by kind of setting the scene and letting you all know where we are going today. Character assassination is all around us, right? Um, take, for example, this New York Times list, the 425 people, places, and things Donald Trump has insulted, and this is only on Twitter. It's a complete list that is currently being updated. Some highlights include ABC News, Steve Bannon, the DNC, and uh, for those inclined to do more research, you can click those links and it will take you right to the tweets as evidence for these claims. Um, the website also includes, of course, targets for Mitt Romney, a disaster candidate, Jeb Bush, a total embarrassment for himself and his family, Bernie Sanders, a waste of time, and Hillary Clinton, this one in all caps, failed all over the world. Yet, lest we think that character assassination is wholly a United States phenomenon, I want to pause and make clear that in every historical time period we have looked at, and in every cultural and country-based context we have looked at, character assassination exists. As one quick example, think about Russia. Vladimir Putin's critics often get accused of personal transgressions and smeared by government-controlled media before they can become too troublesome for uh, his personal agenda. Nonetheless, it certainly seems clear that character assassination and incivility in U.S. politics is indicative of U.S. political culture right now. Um, think about Twitter, cable news, and even the very structure of our presidential debates really incentivize and encourage people to be nasty. Um, so as our kind introduction said, we are representatives from the Research Lab for Character Assassination and Reputation Politics. Um, if you want to follow us on Twitter or look at our website, it's all up there. Um, but I guess we actually don't really need to introduce ourselves too much more. Um, but one of the things that I do want to note is that we all come to studying character assassination from different disciplinary homes. So although we share a common vocabulary for trying to understand what character assassination is and how it works, we do it from some similar vocabulary, but also from some different academic perspectives as well. And you'll get to see that a little bit later. Um, so here we are. Um, aren't we beautiful? Martin could not be with us today um, for the sole reason that he's in Amsterdam and that's far away. But he is one of our, our contributors as well. So here are the things that we want to talk to you about this afternoon. Start by setting the scene with thinking about what character assassination is before talking to you about why it's important for understanding US political culture um, and political cultures more generally, perhaps. Introduce you to the work that we do at CARP before providing maybe some little snippets and case studies that should hopefully whet your palate in terms of thinking about some of the different ways that we actually go about studying character assassination. I promise I will let them talk later, um, but I'm actually going to kick it off with answering this first question and getting into what character assassination actually is. So the definition that we work with as scholars is that character assassination refers to the deliberate destruction of an individual's reputation or character. And character assassination occurs through a combination of character attacks, which are the individual assaults or attempts or smears. And those eventually, if they are successful, add up to character assassination, the successful attacks that ultimately harm someone's reputation. Two things I want to point out about character assassination before we move on. One is that it's intentional. This is not sort of an, oh, whoops, Ted Cruz looks at porn kind of thing. This is someone actively making a choice to circulate arguments about someone's negative reputation. Um, so character assassination is intended to accomplish a goal. And as we know, often that goal is to gain the political upper hand. Second thing that's important is to note that character assassination is public. People design character attacks to sway an audience, to encourage them to do something, to think something, and to um, see a person in a particular way. Of course. Studying character assassination sort of begs the question of what is character, right? If you're going to say that someone's character has been destroyed, 
What are we talking about? What does that mean? Um, and the short answer to that question is that it depends a great deal on who you ask. In the 1920s and sort of the founding of academic disciplines of psychology, things like personality, temperament, and character were all used relatively interchangeably. That has since changed as the academic disciplines have branched apart. But when we talk about character today, we're referring to relatively stable features of an individual. But what makes character different from things like temperament and personality is that we tend to ascribe a moral dimension to character in a way that we don't those other things, right? So good character means things like honesty, humility, and industry and hard work, right? Now, of course, one thing that I think is really important to stress and to highlight is that what good character means depends a great deal on the cultural and historical context in which you're operating, right? What it means to be a good woman is a lot different now than it was in the 1880s, right? Um, so things like having a job, being a good mother are valued and talked about in ways that are different, of course, than they were in the past. But nonetheless, if we think about character as something that's a relatively stable trait that an individual has, one of the things that we also need to think about is what is reputation, right? And in some ways, I think reputation is almost more important than character because reputation is the matter of public opinion, right? It's how the public sees your character and understands who it is that you are. Since I'm a communication scholar, but also because I think communication is important, um, one of the things I also want to highlight is that communication is fundamental, right? If character assassination is both intentional and public, it's carried out in communication. So I want to pause for a second here before we start diagramming what character assassination looks like and mention a little bit about what communication scholars have said about character. And communication theorists dating all the way back to the ancient founding texts of disciplines like rhetoric have thought about character. And in fact, Quintilian famously defined oratory as the good man speaking well. So recognizing things like trustworthiness, research, evidence, a balanced case as central to being what good communication was. This develops into sort of the counter, uh, the, I guess I should say the centerpiece of studying rhetoric today, which is Aristotle's three pillars of persuasion. If you've taken public speaking, remember all the way back to this, right? <laughs> the top here, though, is ethos. And ethos is the way that communication scholars talk about character. Ethos means credibility. And ethos is a way of building an argument based on authority. So it says, believe me, because I am the sort of person that you can believe. Right, I have a strong character, and I have your best interests as an audience at heart. So what's important, right, is that things like character, reputation, and then how that gets communicated all work together to become the components of the character uh, assassination attempt. And one of the things that the three of us really want to emphasize is that although we all come at studying character assassination from slightly different perspectives, we tend to think that in order to have a complete understanding of what character assassination is, you should at minimum try to consider these couple of things. So we'll talk through these before moving into some examples, which is the more fun stuff, right? So the attacker, of course, is the person who has a motive, a motive to destroy someone's reputation and who ultimately makes the choice of what strategy they're going to use to carry out the attack that they then launch to take down the target. Targets of character assassination are typically relatively prominent individuals, politicians, celebrities, sometimes academics. Um, but one of the things that I want to point out here is that we purposely choose the word target instead of victim because victim is a sort of socially constructed state and one can sort of choose to play up the victim card and in some cases character assassination sort of rolls right off you like as Eric likes to say Teflon. Um, so it's not always that the target is a victim but we choose target as the term instead of victim. Medium, of course, is how the attack is communicated, and certainly the attacker typically selects the medium with an eye toward the audience or who it is that they're trying to reach. Um, and one of the things, of course, that's 
always important is to recognize that character assassination is judged in the court of public opinion, right? How your reputation and character is seen in the public ultimately determines whether the attack has been successful or not. Last thing here then is the context. As a rhetorician, I think in some ways the context is the most important part. But what we're talking about here is the political, cultural, and social surroundings of the character attack. Because of course, as I mentioned before, moral codes are embedded in social and cultural traditions. They're not universal across cultures. As one easy example, think about is divorce sanctioned in politics, right? American culture is changing on this, but it would be very weird for Americans to think about a president divorced in the White House and like actively going on dates while running the country, right? That's so weird that Aaron Sorkin made a movie about it like 20 years ago. But if you look at public opinion polls in Russia and France, they don't care, right? So an example of the way that, that moral codes are, are different. And then, of course, the other component of context, the political context, is important for how easy it is for the target to actually respond, right? In a democratic society, you at least have some procedural rights and some ability to, to tweet your response or post a blog about why you're still a good person. Um, totalitarian regimes where the media is state-controlled and the internet is censored creates a very different dynamic um, for people who are the target of character attacks. Um, last thing I'll note before I will turn it over to my lovely co-authors here is just to think a little bit about how it is that we might categorize character assassination. And these are just some of the methods that we've uncovered in the research that we've done. Labeling is sort of a quick and easy way of saying he's a fascist, she's a communist, he's sexist, sort of attaching simple labels to someone. Allegations kind of about spreading rumors about someone's personal um, transgressions. Ridicule, very powerful in our um, current political culture, but making someone the laughing stock, right? I'll show you an example in a second. Dehumanization takes that further by making them <laughs> so disgusting and beyond the pale that they're not even human. And then disgracing is about vandalism and sort of destroying um, the memories of that person and then ultimately silencing can actually sometimes play out in literally erasing political figures from textbooks and that kind of thing. A couple quick examples. Um, Twitter's a fun one. I don't know if you know the Twitter handle Roy Moore's horse or if you have been following um, Roy Moore's horse, um, but this is a great example of ridicule and also an example of a relatively anonymous character attack, right? Sometimes we know who the attacker is and sometimes we don't. In this case, Roy Moore's horse tweets a lot, subjecting both Roy Moore, the former candidate for the Senate Republican seat, uh, the Senate seat in Alabama, um, to ridicule, and in this case, of course, he's ridiculing um, Trump and the, the Easter egg roll. And then here's just a, a quick international example of disgracing, right? So in India, tensions boiling over and ultimately manifesting in vandalism of statues of Gandhi, for instance. So it's not just that, uh, that character assassination is like tweets and words. It's also vandalism, destroying paintings of George Washington, for example, taking down statues or removing someone's name from history books. So that's sort of a broad, what is character assassination? What is the vocabulary we're using to think about it and study it? I'm going to toss it over to my colleague, Sergei, to talk a little bit about why character assassination is important for us to understand. Thank you, Jenny. It was a wonderful uh, introduction, and uh, <clears throat> the reason why we actually uh, talk about character assassination now and why it really matters in this political context, because uh, of one uh, word, media, that we all know about, and of course, we don't understand it because it changes so fast. Remember, like in 1987, Gary Hart, who was a brilliant and visionary political thinker who, who seemed likely to capture the whole democratic nomination and presidency, uh, pretty much in one week became to one-liner, right? And people still remember Gary Hart, not for his political ideas, not for uh, his vision, but for his uh, excursion with uh, you know, Donna Rice, uh, on a boat uh, called Monkey Business, right? Remember that case? And Gary Hart pretty much, uh, his fall was so catastrophic and so permanent because of a lot of things happening in the 80s to the media, right? So um, 
There is a wonderful book uh, written by uh, Matt Bai, who is a writer at Yahoo News, and he's right now actually making a movie about Gary Hart based on his book, uh, played by Hugh, 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 Hugh Jackman, by the way. It's in, in production. So uh, he was talking about like a few things happening in the 1980s when the media has changed. Well, the first thing that uh, was a ride with new technology, like fax machines. Now we think about fax machines, something is over. Back then, fax machines were cool because, I mean, you can actually uh, uh, overnight send somebody information and curate, uh, you know, news from all over the world and in the morning published elsewhere. So people actually uh, started uh, hearing more about those scandals and crises and uh, reputational um, uh, reputational uh, errors. So, and uh, then pretty much uh, we can also see how in the 80s was a rise of political shows, uh, like for example CNN Crossfire and uh, a lot of political debates. And uh, the third, the most important thing, there was a new generation of um, journalists who saw Watergate crisis and uh, quickly understood how it was easy to make a career just by um, you know, cracking down on someone's reputation and finding one corrupt politician or some politician maybe with some uh, alleged uh, or some questionable story that could be further investigated and brought to the public light, right? And pretty much uh, it has pretty much changed the media. So Gary Hart uh, became a victim in this case because he misunderstood how to handle media. In addition to his awkward answer, answers on television, um, he pretty much challenged the media outlets and said, well, if you have something on me, just follow, follow me and just you know, <laughs> bring it up. And there's nothing uh, like this a uh, modern politicians would do these days. They would never uh, think of challenging the media uh, like that. So pretty much um, uh, what we, when we talk about media these days, we pretty much uh, talking about not just the channel, but how the whole environment has changed. And uh, pretty much uh, why character assassination and reputational issues are uh, kind of important here, because uh, pretty much we talk about how three uh, what we call production frames now pretty much occupy all this media content, and uh, those were summarized by Robert Entman as you know simplification of content, symbolization, personalization, and personalization actually is one of the very important component here because. Um, um, Lots of scholars have written about person-centered politics. With the decline of political parties, what we have now is personalities who are pretty much understood in terms of politics. So we judge all these political actions and policy based on personalities uh, and based on people who uh, represent those uh, those issues, right? So, um, so pretty much any slant in the news creates what we call emotional logic where we are more willing to uh, judge uh, someone's um, policies based on you know, emotions. And, uh, pretty much, um, at, at this point, we can see how media has entered uh, the politics and created this, uh, yeah, what we call mediatization. So mediatization refers to the uh, imposition of uh, media logic upon other institutions. And as a result, media creates its own institutional logic. So pretty much uh, mass media becomes independent from political power, and then political and social actors start adapting to mass media, and they follow the rules on the media. And that's why now we see how politicians are compelled to go and participate in those late night uh, shows or acts on the media. So instead of talking about important things like uh, policies, they're trying to impress and entertain us. And from thinkers and political leaders, they become performers. So the question is, how long can we, um, you know, uh, entertain ourselves again? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, luckily, on that question, that's where we come in. So I'm going to turn it over to Eric, who's going to talk a little bit about what CARP does and what some of the things that we're trying to accomplish. Do you want to click or you want me to click? Yep. Down to earth. Uh, just today, uh, around noon, I got a phone call, actually it was WhatsApp uh, message, uh, from my good friend, uh, my loyal good friend since, since childhood, and she complained about uh, her mother, actually about the media. Her mother is a local celebrity, uh, 
that ghost. Uh, and uh, her mother was hospitalized yesterday. And the headlines on that ghost uh, media sources have been uh, like this. Uh, uh, such and such person has been hospitalized, left alone to die, family nowhere to be found. She told me, how come I contacted doctors, I Ubered her to the hospital, I spent 16 hours with her, just right there in her bed, and now just, a, well, they, they spread this, this news about my mother, about me. I said, look, you are a grown-up woman. Uh, why do you care? It's just, just not true. Her answer was, it hurts. It hurts. Uh, even, though, uh, even though she knows that wasn't true, still the public exposure and public uh, image that's have been formed, uh, or is being formed, is what uh, we emphasize in character assassination. Uh, about the same type of examples um, encouraged me a long time ago to start thinking about uh, this subject. Late Lee Siegelman, uh, who was editor-in-chief of American Political Science Review, asked me one day, long time ago, Eric, uh, have you heard about character assassination? As a big shot, I said, of course I, I, I do. I didn't know. I think about that. And he told me, please investigate maybe just your right paper uh, on that subject. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away before it was possible to accomplish. And things started. Just a, a small presentation at the Paris conference uh, with a, a, just a few and far between attendants right there. Just in, I just delivered paper. Then somebody contacted me just from the Netherlands. <coughs> saying that, so, well, that we have some funding, let's just organize conference on this uh, subject in Heidelberg. But then more uh, Rome, uh, more uh, just done in terms of publishing, first book published in New York City uh, by, by Paul Grace Macmillan. Uh, then, uh, well, my colleague, my esteemed colleagues, just know how lazy and disorganized I am, just contacted me saying, we must do something about the subject and do something. And they have done uh, many uh, organizational things uh, a foundation of a lab. Uh, of course, we're underfunded, but we are, we are just uh, trying to, 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 to hold it. Uh, then uh, we had first international conference uh, organized at, at George Mason. Uh, well, we have a handbook, uh, which is basically in print. It takes a few months, of course, before it sees the light. And also, we are working on a textbook, a small few things. You forgot to put major talk at IWP um, oh, in 2018. Yeah, just a yeah. major talk right here, unless we still don't have rotten tomatoes, just a scheme <laughs> have rotten tomatoes, because we will, uh, we'll, be, we'll, we'll be fine with that. Plus many other things, including next year, international uh, seminar on this on this subject. So it's a brief history of, 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 the, of the project. Uh, yes, there are books. Yes, there are publications. Yes, yes, there are, there are um, uh, seminars and discussions just, just on the academic side. Uh, we represent, uh, as we know this briefly, fields rhetoric, public relations, Sergey, uh, history, uh, political psychology, and deliberately uh, we overlapping uh, in every possible way to the theory. Well, this is this are, these are our uh, names and mugshots. Uh, besides, besides teaching, of course, this is uh, probably one of the major responsibilities. We teach uh, undergraduates and just begin begin to to teach some graduate students and our schools. Uh, the most important thing, just to think at the, from my standpoint, is help individuals to assess their own risk. Uh, either public official or uh, a candidate for public office, uh, a person who is a school board, person who is a uh, president of a university, a uh, businesswoman, businessman, so any person who has some public disorder is vulnerable. And so the question is, can we assess his or her vulnerability that doctors just just scanning and checking our blood, say, look, this is a problem, this problem is potentially not. Can we do so? I think we can. We're not doctors, but uh, using contemporary methods, just I hope we can do something uh, in terms of assessment of vulnerability. Uh, big question, of course. Uh, can we uh, uh, defend, can, uh, can we defend against character attacks? If we can, what do we have to do? Key, key question is respond or not to respond. Uh, to respond or not to respond. Uh, if respond, if to respond, what uh, we, we should do, what, what it is what we, we study. Uh, and also, uh, in this regard, not only psychological defenses, media defense, all the public strategy against character attacks, uh, that uh, uh, should be known and given people as, as defense weapon shields against uh, something that uh, we, we consider this to becoming stronger and more sophisticated than what character uh, attacks. Once again, this features. So, uh, we uh, uh, look at a variety of, 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 of types of methods of attacks, uh, and just, just a few examples, again, I am down to earth right now, so that look, uh, uh, 
few examples of, of cheap shots and distortions, characters against the public officials, insults, which uh, will uh, remain really, really uh, powerful, uh, just uh, uh, in the minds of uh, not only opponents but uh, supporters of, of public figures, public figures, uh, labeling of individuals, uh, exaggerated or not. Uh, and then again, uh, as Sergei and Jenny pointed out, that small examples uh, that's maybe relevant to someone's character, but become, they become exaggerated. Mm -hmm. It's just small surveys we conducted among the students suggest that most students, especially, especially well, first, six, second year students, one of about U.S. presidents, they remember key phrases, key associations uh, that's, that attach to their names. Uh, Nixon, Watergate, Clinton. I will uh, mention what they mentioned. Uh, and and so I believe uh, we didn't study Trump yet, but the leaders as many, many associates will be, will be, will be recalled. Because. So lies, uh, exaggerations, uh, cheap shots, name calling, and other things, just they, they can be completely irrelevant, and yet, and yet they, they uh, stick, uh, they stay, and they affect public opinion uh, of individuals. Uh, the, uh, uh, just uh, examples in national politics, just we uh, received uh, interest, uh, receiving interest from, from uh, individuals to in engage in diplomacy, uh, public policy, and national relations. A few examples, just recent example from three days ago, just to say how messages can be framed by, by foreign governments in the media, uh, organized it, uh, or not delivered, uh, delivered attempts to smear and diminish the importance of certain public messages. Uh, this, this is for real. Russian senator claimed that the Queen Elizabeth uh, and uh, uh, Theresa May, Prime Minister of, of uh, UK, well, just they have drinking habits. Uh, and then, then uh, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, specialists in alcoholism discuss the way Prime Minister holds glass, suggesting that if she drank wine on a daily basis, she would have uh, controlled the stem of glass. But because he holds it, he wants to warm it up. It means that he drinks brandy on a daily basis. How just takes so what? Uh, the the underlying. <laughs> Well, how can we trust those British with their allegations about so-called poisoning of uh, so-called spies when they have drinking problems themselves? Yeah. And just, well, you know, for the vast majority of Russians, I believe that this is some sort of sort of encouragement. Yes, the British are drunks. Uh, their poor poison is just as the uh, result of their drunken delirium. Uh, disgraceful uh, well, message right here. I think it's sorry, it's it's, it's right here. It's one of the billboards, uh, posters in, in Russia uh, four years ago. It's about, uh, well, it's smoking pills. Just, uh, just uh, show, uh, show uh, President Obama uh, who is inhaling. And one of the most disgraceful attempts on there, I show you, uh, it's attacks on our uh, former ambassador to Russia, Mike McFall. You know, this is a researcher, he's a scholar, he is a great person. Uh, but uh, he was attacked viciously, and one of those attacks was associated with a, uh, with a with attaching his name to uh, to to uh, uh, to uh, sexual perversion, he was compared to a pedophile. Out of nothing, out of nowhere, out of nothing, just a message was uh, Mike McFall, uh, who is a pedophile. Pedophile. Uh, the YouTube clip uh, became viral when some pro-Putin group, probably paid for you know, just by 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 the government or by by some NGOs in Russia, uh, just to, uh, ask people in the street uh, to compare uh, two uh, portraits of uh, one uh, and second individual. And they were asked, uh, just uh, by glancing, by uh, uh, can you tell who is a pedophile? And just all, all people, this was definitely, definitely edited, show that Mike, Mike Paul clip uh, went viral. Mike was uh, bitter, he was upset, he was, uh, uh, well, just, uh, really upset and, and affected his diplomatic work for sure. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. So that's a little bit of an introduction to what we do as scholars, and Eric has pointed to some of the um, different types of work that we do, as well as to some of the examples of character assassination, how we kind of think about it, both in the U.S.-based and um, international context. Before we open it up for questions, um, I've invited all of us, including me, um, to give just sort of a brief, you know, couple minute case study that gives a sense of some of the research projects that we're working on now, so a little bit more in depth than just the, the snapshot examples that we just gave you, but also as a way, I think, to emphasize 
one of our central points, which is that character assassination is best understood from interdisciplinary perspectives, right? You need to have a variety of academic disciplinary tools in order to understand um, the, the ways that it works in our society. Um, so I'm a rhetorician. A rhetoric is a fancy word for persuasion. So some of the questions that I'm interested in answering through my research is, where does character come from? And how is it communicated in messages that are strategically designed? And again, with the focus on persuasion, how does character assassination persuade audiences? When does it work and when doesn't it work? So I, I'm interested in diagramming communication interactions to understand why some people are Teflon and some people are not. Um, so let me tell you quickly about a little a uh, research project that I have been working on and that will actually be forthcoming in the Rutledge Handbook that has been mentioned so far. Let me set the scene. Um, I'm also a, a historian, so um, the case study that I was looking at was Ed, uh, Edward R. Murrow's CBS television news documentary on See It Now, report on Senator Joseph McCarthy. Um, and so Murrow's television 30-minute report has been acclaimed as the best half hour in television history um, and is seen as the key thing that ultimately brought down Senator McCarthy and led to his 1954 censure by the Senate. For what it's worth, that's actually not true, and Murrow was on the, the sort of waning end of trying to, to call attention to what McCarthy was doing to U.S. politics. Um, but Murrow created and aired a 30-minute television report um, calling attention to McCarthy's sort of browbeating, red-baiting tactics, and he put it together by using words and videos of the senator's own statements. Murrow later invited uh, McCarthy to respond to his report. McCarthy waited a month to do it, which was a bad idea. Um, and when McCarthy did respond, his response was like wandering and totally unhinged and made no sense. Um, but this case study was interesting to me for a couple of reasons. One, it's an example of a, a real exchange of Murrow launching a character attack on McCarthy, McCarthy responding. But it's also something that needs to be situated in the geopolitical context of the global Cold War, right? Um, but also, thinking about media, as Sergei called our attention to, it's something that we need to understand in the context of the intense amount of trust that Americans in the 1950s had for television news um, and saw television news as this unbiased report on the world. Um, my, how things have changed, right? Um, so as I'm diagramming and thinking about this exchange between Murrow and McCarthy, one of the things that I'm interested in trying to understand is why was Murrow so successful when McCarthy roundly failed? And one of the things that's important to recognize is that Murrow had a prior reputation of being one of the most trusted men in America. And that's a reputation that he had built, he had built through years as a war correspondent in London during World War II. Um, so his prior credibility, or what we rhetoricians would call prior ethos, was incredibly strong as a trusted newsman with good character that had the public's best interest at heart. Murrow matched his prior reputation with an incredibly well-researched and really well-developed argument that he aired against Senator McCarthy. So we rhetoricians would call that intrinsic ethos, the credibility he built within the communication interaction. So how he developed his own character as a speaker while he was attacking McCarthy. Um, and so you can see here just from some screenshots that I pulled from the video that he has used the senator's own words against him. He's pulled direct video clips of the senator speaking at different events. And he has edited them, of course, to make McCarthy look like a huge, greasy, sweaty sleazeball, right? Um, so using his own words against him. But at the same time, if you watch the report, Murrow comes across as an, as an urbane, sophisticated, educated person. This is not the screed of a zealot, right? Um, the entire tone of the report is measured, it's rational. And so the thing that's important and interesting to me is that in this exchange, Murrow is able to capitalize on his prior reputation and he develops that prior reputation even as he attacks Senator McCarthy, which is why his attack was so successful and McCarthy's later response was so unsuccessful. So hopefully that gives you a little sense of some of the ways that I think about character assassination and how it's developed in communication and also lets us 
feel maybe better or worse that this is not wholly a new thing, right? Character assassination has been around for a long time. Um, so I'll turn it over to, to Sergey now to tell you a little bit about some of the things that he researches. Well, I'm in the business of public relations, and uh, pretty much uh, the way I define public relations, I'm in the business of making friends, right? And uh, pretty much one of the, the, the reasons why uh, I'm so successful at um, what I'm doing, because I'm good at making friends and uh, taking care of their reputations and my own reputation, as I said, right? So um, PR people were supposed to actually uh, produce a lot of publicity, right? When it comes to reputation management, however, um, you know, uh, actually uh, creating a story is not always the best way to take care of reputation. That kind of brings us to the whole question of uh, crisis management. And uh, so, because when you deal with crisis management, pretty much uh, most of the time you want the story to go away. Uh, you, you want to contain the story, not to kind of start talking about the story so it. Uh, could be uh, echoed by a lot of people uh, on the internet, for example. And uh, one of the uh, cases uh, I could think of is um, uh, just a case a few years ago when a, uh, there was a amateur video uploaded on the internet, uh, pretty much uh, with character assassination against uh, Prophet Muhammad. So you can remember that? That video pretty much went viral. And it was very interesting to me how uh, a video which was produced by an independent filmmaker uh, and uh, pretty much almost uh, with no budget involved and amateurish cast um, resonated so much all over the world. As you, as you remember, it resulted in multiple uh, protests and demonstrations in, in Muslim countries. It was linked to uh, all these attacks on American embassies overseas. <laughs> Um, it basically it became so um, uh, so critical that even President Obama had to uh, comment on that. And there were a lot of uh, conversations online whether um, uh, you know YouTube needs to take it down and whether we should actually um, re reconsider our um, our policies and rules over the internet. So pretty much, what was so interesting about that case is that we live right now in the world where um, the consequences of individual action uh, can uh, go into a different bifurcation point. So in other words, uh, as um, one of our uh, colleagues, Eric Desenhold, who is a crisis manager in Washington, D.C., says, right now we're all, uh, we live in the world uh, which is full of you know, volume, velocity, and venom. So in other words, uh, through social media, we have lots and lots of information where, well, which is a lot of content produced by independent actors, uh, and the velocity of news in 24 7 news cycle um, pretty much uh, generate more and more information, which is pretty much full, full of you know, character attacks, incivility, and venom, like in, uh, in politics and in economics and in different, different fields. So, and pretty much the way it uh, affects global society because, because of globalization, we're all interconnected, and um, so big, large events happen more often, and uh, it, they affect a lot of people on different levels. Not just uh, regular people, they affect corporations, they affect governments, they affect uh, uh, career politicians. So uh, as a result, we live in this complex society where, uh, for people like myself, it's really hard to uh, analyze, assess any potential risks, uh, prevent them from happening, and uh, take care of the consequences, because I mean, um, once you deal with one crisis, there is another crisis uh, emerges, and uh, there is no way to pretty much adjust to all this constant um, content creation and uh, crisis happening every day. So at this point, um, um, in this situation, public relations people, crisis managers, we uh, constantly have to monitor and watch the media. We have to become synergetic with uh, online audiences. We have to kind of keep up with this uh, online collective pulse. And that creates our job extremely, extremely uh, difficult, but very important as well. That does sound hard. Um, yeah. Glad that's your job, not mine. All right, lastly, Eric, can you take it away? How do you do that? Well, uh, quickly repeat uh, uh, what we study, uh, certainly, and what we try to apply uh, uh, the attackers, the methods uh, through which the attacks uh, disseminated uh, the target. 
must be receptive audience. If somebody uh, privately after our, our talk will come to me and says, you know, Professor Eric, uh, we know that, I know that you torture goats in your backyard uh, in private conversation. I don't think it will become a character attack because nobody knows about that. I just and I say, look, it's not true. Okay, so fine. Tweet that right definitely, now. definitely, right? If you tweet right now, so <laughs> have to have that's the yeah, audience right there, and I have to either defend myself mm -hmm. or be silent about uh, goats. I don't torture goats, just to some disclosure. But however, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're not just just my team to to question my 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 uh, my, my my behavior. Uh, uh, the the subject of political psychology is to to connect politics and 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 psychology. Uh, to find the intersection and, uh, uh, to the best of our ability, suggest how psychological factors affect politics uh, and so whether or not they affect, affect politics or, or, or uh, uh, they don't, they don't. Uh, calling uh, somebody a rocket man or other just, just uh, uh, other name, does it, will it affect the relation between two countries? Uh, classical diplomacy says should not, classical diplomacy is shying away from, from uh, well, considering psychological factors uh, in detail, we try to bring them and suggest maybe their effect. How we don't know. We use three sources of, of, of knowledge for us. Our breakfast is history. We just get examples from history. Our lunch is experimental research, and uh, our dinner just just a big dinner. Unfortunately, just only common sense and just <laughs> and speculation about what we know, what we don't know. Because we definitely we need to develop uh, our 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 methods. Uh, the uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the uh, one of the uh, one of the examples uh, uh, which I suggest is uh, uh, that uh, some character attacks may may backfire. That's exactly this one. Uh, questions we all the question we always receive. Well, uh, Eric, uh, professor, it's irrelevant uh, if I'm going to vote for uh, this candidate. Uh, character attacks will not affect my choice uh, if I don't going to vote for for the candidate. Just how just would I? be so receptive to a character tax if I don't want to vote for this person. Studies show that, in fact, uh, the impact would be significant. Character tax, uh, in fact, encourage the opponents, the person to be more uh, active, more proactive, more uh, uh, belligerent, if you will, more vulgar, because attacks are taking place. And some of us, in uh, four, five, ten percent, uh, feeling that there are character attacks against our candidate, we may stay at home or just find another reason not to come uh, and cast our ballot for, uh, for uh, our candidate. Uh, and uh, character attacks change in the context. Many years ago, just remember the case of Eagleton, uh, just, um, uh, suggestions of mental illness uh, were basically just uh, quelled as just, uh, just political suicide. And that he was recommended just to, to, to drop off the race because today I don't think it will become, become, uh, become an issue. Infidelity has been a big deal today. In France, I don't know, just, I just Canada, the United States, just, it becomes less important. However, it is important. Public opinion changes uh, and perceptions change, and therefore methods of character attacks uh, change uh, uh, as well. Because I introduced just as few, just few uh, uh, type of examples uh, that we uh, uh, currently, I'm currently engaged in studying, working on, and finding finding application. And uh, just one last example. So, uh, attacking a CEO uh, of a company attacking our or uh, chief financial officer. How does it affect the company's reputation? We don't know about that. So there's common sense, there's effects, but how uh, yeah, just we still just don't know and taking first steps in that direction. Awesome. So let's just quickly wrap up here and then we can open the floor for questions from you all. Um, we tried to explain a little bit today about who we are, what we do, what character assassination is, and why we think it's important for understanding um, U.S. and, in fact, global political culture. Um, Sarah did a great job of explaining sort of the way that these things tend to ripple, especially for people that are responsible for cleaning it up. Um, but the last thing that I, I want to note is we do all of this research not with the goal of making you all better at attacking your opponents, but instead we actually really believe that understanding how and why character assassination happens means that we can better understand the incentives people respond to, why they do it, and it is our hope that actually this research can maybe provide some type of antidote to the incivility and misinformation that characterizes our current moment. Um, a small hope and maybe a small step down that road, but it's ultimately our hope that by thinking a little bit more about this and trying to understand how it works, we might have something to say about how we can return to a more robust, deliberative democracy. 
All right. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm not in charge here, so I don't know how we're supposed to handle questions or if people should just if they'll get. Well, it's a free country. We can do whatever. Okay. Um, all right. Yes, sir. The um, I wonder if you, you draw a distinction between uh, truth and fiction. You know, to me, that's a big difference because if, if it's true, it's true, and it, then it comes back to the culture of the society. And the trouble with Eagleton was that um, I was in that business. He could not, in security clearance business, he would not be eligible for security clearance at that time based on what had happened. And so we're going to put the man, you know, heartbeat away from the nukes who wouldn't be eligible if he wasn't a politician for security clearance. So, but it, it goes back, to, like, I'm old enough to remember uh, Donna Rice and, uh, <laughs> and the, the, the but, but it's true. I mean, to me, a more interesting character assassination would be what happened to, um, oh, what's his name, the, the senator from Maine who was, you know, crying, crying at the New Hampshire right. primary. And um, that ruined, you know, because he sh was showing too much um, uh, emotion. Right. But to me, that's like a character assassination, and I think he handled it badly when he... Uh, but, but do you draw a distinction between what's true and what's false? Well, I can say, well, uh, not always. Uh, Eagle case uh, depends on diagnosis. Take one psychiatrist, uh, I can diagnose one way, can take a concilium different ways. I understand that it had been diagnosed. However, a second evaluation, third, we know, but that is how they evaluate. So. Uh, and uh, Obama did make decision on Syria. He's made, but this, well, we call him coward. But he's a, a supporter, a brave man, brave, wise man. Just and this, just we follow our motto in the White House: don't do stupid, stupid, and well, stuff, right? So, well, he is he is a hero in the eyes of his opponents. The uh, uh, proponents, opponents say coward. Trump, imagine just will procrastinate, just making decisions about Syria. Well, his opponents said he is coward. So just a little bit attached. Although he said, no, I am the best man. It's the best decision ever. It's been so smart, so good. Best decision ever about Syria. Well, you're right. So we either hear or not hear, but then the interpretation of actions is is what public wants to hear or well, what the public hears. It's my, my, my view on this. Okay, uh, so we, we need to understand that when we talk about character assassination, we're talking about duality. So uh, we also we talk about the process uh, methods used, and we also look at character assassination as the outcome of this process. So, in, in this case, that's why it's such a complex issue. And the way uh, you know how character assassination happens, we'll look, have to look at the continuum. So, because there is no such a thing as absolute character assassination, you know, because we have no cases when political actors could, you know, uh, arise from the dead and pretty much get back in, into business. And uh, how do you measure? character assassination as an outcome? Well, we can use some uh, you know, measurable numerical indicators, like, for example, decline in, in public opinion. We can uh, uh, use surveys to see how people think about, uh, you know, people, uh, politicians under attack. Uh, we can uh, take a look at, you know, we can interview people and see, uh, you know, their, measure their attitudes and beliefs about uh, public figures who uh, survived character assassination. But uh, just like uh, Jenny said, it all depends on the context because we have to consider so many factors, including culture, including current social norms, including uh, support from the family, and uh, you know, pretty much this availability of what we call social capital because some political actors have more social, uh, social capital than others and there is nobody to back them up. They just go down like this. I want to say one quick thing and then I want to get to other right. questions. Um, in some ways it matters and in some ways it doesn't, right? Whether the character attack is true or false. Um, because as Eric said, it's all about what the public perceives as to whether um, the attack is successful and actually succeeds in damaging someone's reputation. But certainly whether the information is true or false is one aspect of the strategic calculus of how you might respond to it, right? Certainly it's a heck of a lot easier to point out that someone's lying than try to work around a character attack that's actually true, um, I guess is what I'll say. Other question? Yes, sir. Uh, 
question would be interesting to, to chart the increase in character assassination versus the decrease in the social acceptability of dueling as a means of resolving character assassination. <laughs> and Andrew, Andrew Jackson is a great study right. where someone attacked the character of his wife, had the duel, he carried a bullet to his chest mm -hmm. the rest of his life mm -hmm. when he killed the uh, accuser. Uh, sometimes character assassination continues after physical assassination. Yes, uh, that's right. point, John Kennedy, and it's timely because we're still waiting for Trump to hopefully release all of the still sealed records. But there's a book titled Plausible Denial by Mark Lane. It recounts a uh, libel trial in Miami in 1985. E. Howard Hunt, former Watergate burglar, uh, in the Nixon White House, confessed to, while he was in the Nixon White House, he worked at forging historically backdated cables to blame Kennedy for ordering the assassination of the vice president of Vietnam, Diem, as opposed to simply encouraging the, the abdication. And so sometimes it continues in history. That's right. Yeah. Khrushchev was dismissed from power and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union did everything possible simply to erase his name from every document and he was allowed to, to mention only by a title, former prime minister, that's it. No mentioning about him. That's the expensive job for the Communist Party. It's very much worth it. The Trump dossier, I'm sure you could speak at length about that, and is Comey committing character suicide by his work? That's a great question. Um, I, th I mean, I think there will be enough people that will see it as as brave that he'll be fine. Um, but I don't know. What are the rest of y'all thinking? Uh, well, again, uh, definitely just like going back to what you said, it is all the problem of public opinion. And the way we perceive it you know, now might, might, might change. That's right. The same thing we, uh, well, uh, Eric mentioned uh, Khrushchev. What about Trotsky and his role in the, and pretty much how he has been perceived in different countries? Uh, obviously, his name was dropped from all the um, history books in the Soviet Union, but now he's really back in public discourse and there are a couple of books made about him. Uh, however, in countries like Latin America, he's been you know, revered and respected for all these years for what he has done. Yeah, I think that's a good example because it shows that it's not always linear. Um, in some of the longer work where we lay out our theoretical framework for studying character assassination, we identify what we call interactional dynamics, recognizing that character assassination happens in interactions. And the living versus post-mortem is one distinction that we make there, um, because your point is very well taken, that it does often happen as we work through how we want to remember people after they pass or are physically assassinated. I saw another hand over here. Yes, sir. You know, when something comes out, you know, and I, and my little addendum here is, you know, Trump seems to have taken the approach that fight fire with fire. Now, if someone comes out with a comment or something, the best way to do it is to immediately respond fire with fire. Do you have any, any comments or you know, thoughts on, on this timing issue? And what it means for defense? Do you want to take that as a PR person? Uh, yes. So, uh, just like I mentioned, right now, uh, pretty much um, negativity, incivility, and frequent character attacks have become systemic norm. And when we're talking about systemic norm, I'm talking about like a, a firm media ecosystem, because when I was talking about media logic, we're talking about how media became an institution and thrives on incivility as a money-making mechanism. Because when we talk about media, we're talking about not just professional interests, but also commercial interests. But what, gen what generates income is clickbait and information that is sensational news and uh, pretty much anything that has to do with personalities. So nobody cares about good news. What would be like a day when we open like, newspapers and say, hey, uh, you know, this uh, Fairfax Police Department helped uh, s uh, school children uh, over the weekend, right? So nobody, you know, weekends. Nobody wants to uh, you know, read about drama, about conflict, about scandals. And that has become fuel of today's media environment. Um, so nowadays, I mean, media environment is not only in the traditional media, but also in social media. And now, with all people actively participating in additional, uh, what would we say, um, user-generated content, in additional framing, we 
constantly uh, keep on feeling this peace. So at this point, um, the question about you know whether it's like fixed on time and space now become less relevant because it constantly changes, right? And there is no very little time to prepare or even like, assess any potential ways to counter argue. But uh, obviously, uh, one way uh, what we can do as public relations and specialists in crisis managers is uh, just to understand um, the audience and understand how media works. Uh, obviously, a lot of uh, work that we do is not happening. Uh, uh, well, it's it's not on the top of the iceberg. A lot of those things happening with help of um, you know uh, legal specialists and um, uh, people who uh, act, 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 actively deal with uh, crisis managers. We call them like janitors. In other words, I mean, a lot of things happen uh, for them. But um, uh, my, my point is that when you deal with uh, big um, stories in the media, uh, you have to understand a lot of um, like dynamics. So and a lot of those things are kind of invisible. So let's think about, for example, the, the fall of, um, and I have to go in quickly with his name up, but we, we're talking about Weinstein effect. So why is it that even right now, uh, one of the most powerful person in Hollywood became nobody so, what is this butterfly effect when a small, uh, you know, a, a pretty much uh, s uh, kind of small tilt created this huge Me Too campaign, created this ripple effect all over the world? Wait Why now? Wait a second. Right. Um, I don't think we can call that a small thing, right? It was well, we have uncovered decades of systemic. Yeah, but it, like, it was building up. So, it, so one uh, okay, butterfly there effect. Yeah, there was okay. a tilt. Okay. All right. So, I feel it, like it I gotta speak a, for the no, ladies here. Yeah, it became such a huge, huge dominant effect, right? So how can we assess this in terms of like time and space? It's really difficult, right? So obviously we have to do more research and understand, you know, the dynamics behind. Obviously we have to do more uh, analysis about this, right? Maybe it just took all these voices that have been suppressed over years, and maybe some uh, structural changes that right now are really obvious. But will be analyzed by uh, legal historians. In 30 seconds, just briefly, in 30 seconds, sorry about this. Uh, we know today that uh, two factors are important here in terms of time and space uh, individual factors. If I have uh, a very uh, low threshold, so I'm very vulnerable to characters. Imagine I teach, I teach moral values at the university, I chair a committee on ethics at the university. Uh, it takes one misstep and uh, I'll be attacked. Uh, if I'm known as, as a bad guy, bad boy, with multiple detentions and just uh, barely, barely just made my, 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 my cell, well, just barely there, I can do many things. Uh, and, uh, well, well, they know I'm a bad person. Uh, I'm sleazeball for this. I know this. So what, what can it take? And then public climate. Uh, if a public climate is ripening, because the people, people just expecting something to happen, a spark, one spark and just fire is there. If people just uh, bored, is disinterested in a certain issue, they'll simply miss miss um, a character attack because it's just it's not what uh, they pay attention to beyond the immediate response so individual factors uh, and then and then um, a social social factors Trump for example just nothing sticks just 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 this girl walks around and just uh, attacks 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 just just tap one president another one maybe the other one just very nice person like uh, Clinton in many ways was also Um, all right, it's 5.30, but maybe one more quick one. Yes, sir? I want to ask, how does, do you see any differences in the use of character assassination between a, where there's a free press and when there's consolidated national control? And I'm thinking particularly about uh, Russia between the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, people have written that in the 90s, there was a lot of uh, use of compromise with business elite rivals and political rivals. And then once under Putin, the media was more consolidated. It's not just that attacks probably went down against Putin, like you know, you're not allowed to criticize him anymore or um, do those kind of attacks, but just overall the use of character assassination in that society. Let the Russians take that one. <laughs> Today we see exactly this is the government taking over. Uh, government has created and trained uh, a, a vast army uh, uh, or. Professionals who uh, in, engage in this type of work, uh, and not necessarily they've been recruited. Many of them just just simply just enjoy this type of work because the 
the product in society in a system which which uh, uh, encourage you to see, say, U.S. Uh, or their own politics in, in a particular particular way. Uh, we just just yeah exactly you just you underline this just uh, society that's more controlling have more capacity and ability to exercise very attacks and make it more organized. And I think as we learn more about the Russians and what they do and how they do. All right, one more question from the nice lady here. <laughs> Uh, so my question is for, for politicians in particular, public figures, does it matter if they're a bad person if they're good at what they do? That's a very good question. I think that's you can have a, a ethos question there. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> truthfully, this is something that people who study communication have waffled about for yeah. years. Is it, you know, when Quintilian says the good man speaking well, does he actually mean the good man, or does he just mean someone who has convinced everyone that he is good? Um, yeah, um, and I suppose fundamentally, if rhetoric is about persuasion and trying to craft a message for an audience, it is more important that that audience who is, you know, witnessing your communication message see you in that moment as a credible source. Now, you know, that we can, of course, see that as independent from any actions that you take outside of the moment where you're campaigning to voters and that kind of thing. Um, that said, I think as the media, um, as Sergei has pointed out, has become so ever-present, it's really hard to keep those skeletons in the closet. Um, and so, insofar as we at least say, and you know, maybe the, the, the people who study politics a little more than I do can speak to this too, but um, insofar as we say that we value politicians that have some type of moral compass, um, when those things start coming out via social media or other types of leaks, it's hard for us as audience members who are sitting at a speech listening to policy not think about that, right? Not to know that, oh, I heard he beats his wife or whatever. Um, so I would say that on one hand, um, you know, people are often willing to overlook people who do stuff for them. Like, oh, he's kind of a sleazeball, but hey, he lowered my taxes, right? Um, but at the same time, I think pushing that stuff into the background is becoming harder um, with social media and the ever-present news cycle. Well, another important thing is that uh, the problem with politicians that we tend to see them as people, real people that created through like personalization in the media as, as and functions. And uh, sometimes, you know, uh, functions depend on the purpose because we can talk about, you know, uh, charismatic leaders. So is it important to have somebody who is a charismatic leader during the war or during the terrorist attack? Absolutely, because that person can inspire the nation and just motivate us to overcome those uh, difficulties. But what happens when this charismatic leader becomes a populist, right? And kind of... Uh, uses too much power and too much attention to promote his or her personal agenda, right? Instead of focusing on more bureaucratic style leadership, right? And that's kind of very important uh, like function of patients. I'm not a person who actually studies structure like it. I'm fascinated with the whole idea between the relationship of agency and the structure, and uh, I'm, I'm always puzzled by that. That's why we have to look at like both components, both sides of it. My father doesn't have a Facebook account, and he doesn't know what it is, by the way, sorry. But when he saw your narrative about the uh, the testimony by Zuckerberg, he told me this. Never, ever, ever will I open a Facebook account. I think it matters, because he didn't like his editor. He doesn't understand the meaning of, of, of media and his liking and disliking. I just I like his attitude. You know, no Facebook account for me. Bad. He's a professor. He still judges by, by simple things. It, it may matter. Uh, should matter how much uh, we don't know. We should. All right. Well, we don't want to keep you any more past 5:30 on this beautiful day. So thank you so much for coming out to talk with us. And we'll see you